Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my Unsolved Mystery series or if you're new here, welcome. I cover a variety of unsolved crimes on my channel focusing on missing and murdered people as well as the unidentified Jane and John Doe's with the aim that maybe we can help spread the word and provide answers to those who need the most. If you like what I do here don't forget to subscribe and share my videos or my podcasts, particularly if you're from the areas I'm focusing from in these episodes. You never know when the right person might hear this information and come forward with fresh news that could finally provide answers. As you can most likely tell from the title of today's episode, today we're going to be focusing on spreading the story of the Ventura County Jane Doe, also known as Westlake Jane Doe, who was found back in July 1980 in Westlake, Ventura County, California. As you'll come to see, in a rare twist in 2012, somebody was actually convicted of Jane Doe's murder, but the perpetrator has always refused to share any more information about this unidentified victim, if he even knew anything more at all. It was the 18th of July 1980, so 42 years ago now, when the body of Ventura County Jane Doe was found in the upper car park or parking lot of Westlake High School in Thousand Oaks, California by a school employee. She was found partially nude. During the autopsy, it was discovered that she was four to five months pregnant with a male fetus that of course had not survived the ordeal either. The autopsy would also reveal that the woman had been raped, semen was found on the body and remaining clothing, strangled and stabbed to death with 16 stab wounds in total. She had hemorrhaging around her neck which also indicated that she was strangled until she fell unconscious, but ultimately her cause of death was the stab wounds. Thanks to bloody drag marks found nearby, it was theorised that she'd been killed elsewhere and her body being taken to the car park and dumped there, likely dragged out of a car. On her body, Jane Doe also had defensive wounds as if she tried to fight off her attacker and there were signs as well that this was not her first pregnancy, she had an episiotomy scar. It's also said that she appeared to be quite well nourished and adequate prenatal care had taken place so Jane Doe was clearly making an effort to look after herself and her baby. It was thought that Jane Doe had died about 12 hours prior to being found and her face was still fully recognisable. There are a number of composite sketches of her face, this one by Carl Koppelman is probably the most accurate, or at least I should say the most realistic. DNA testing of the Ventura County Jane Doe has shown that she was Native American and Hispanic, with small amounts of Sub-Saharan African and Asian ancestry. According to the Doe Network, she was aged around 15 to 30 years old, but other sources state 20 to 30 years old. She was 5 foot 1 to 5 foot 3, 110 to 115 pounds, so all round quite petite, with black shoulder length hair and bleached tips. Her eyebrows had been shaven off and she had instead penciled in thin brows about a quarter inch above where the natural eyebrows would have been. Her eyes were brown and she was wearing heavy mascara. Her finger and toenails were painted red, she had a mole on the back of her left hand below the index finger and other birthmarks visible on her face. She had two vaccination scars on her upper left arm, a small ovoid scar on her left knee, pierced ears and a scar on her right buttock. That's a lot of distinguishable features for this unidentified woman, somebody must recognise at least one of those things. Jane Doe had also had extensive dental work in her life, her dental charts are available as well as fingerprints and DNA. I will be talking later in the video about the testing her DNA is currently undergoing in order to get her identity. In terms of clothing, Jane Doe is wearing a white pullover short sleeve shirt, a black bra, white underwear and red corduroy pants. Nearby they found a pair of black high heeled open toe shoes that are assumed to have belonged to her but they weren't on the body so we don't know for sure. At the time, back in 1980, of course, a full homicide investigation took place as they tried to find both Jane Doe's identity and that of her killer, but there were never many leads. Some people recalled seeing a woman of a very similar description hitchhiking near the freeway the night before she was found, but this lead wouldn't lead anywhere. Jane Doe would end up being buried at Conejo Mountain Memorial Park in Camarillo just one month later, with detectives storing her clothes, which were the only real evidence in this case, just in case the case was ever reopened. But it went cold very soon after it was discovered. Something interesting though was that just three days earlier, on July 15th, another body had been found in an almond orchard in Delano, Kern County by a maintenance worker. This is about 150 miles north of Thousand Oaks where the Ventura County Jane Doe had been discovered. In terms of the USA, this is incredibly close for two such similar murders to be discovered. 
The Kern County body was also that of a woman who had been murdered about one day prior. She had been stabbed 29 times and had been transported to the place she was found after the fact. Tire tracks were discovered at the scene. Similar to the Ventura County Doe, she was about 25 to 35 years old, 5 foot 4 and 115 pounds. It was also believed that she had given birth at least once and she had been raped before her death. They also found a bottle of beer near her body from which fingerprints were lifted. They didn't know at the time if this beer bottle was definitely connected to the Kern County Jane Doe, but it was potential evidence. As well as that, they also took scrapings from underneath her fingernails as she had clearly fought back against her attacker. However, this was 1980 and of course DNA testing wasn't really a thing yet, not much could be done with these scrapings. I wonder if they knew even back then that this was just a case of waiting, biding their time until the technology caught up. For many years, both Ventura County Jane Doe and the Kern County Jane Doe would remain unidentified, but the Kern County case would take some steps forward in 2008, when a DNA test would finally identify a possible suspect, Wilson Shewis Jr. Apparently, Kern County decided not to prosecute him though until they knew the name of the victim, which does seem to be a poor excuse, but that's what they decided. Wilson Shuest was born in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1951, and he had a criminal record dating all the way back to 1969. As a teenager, he was known to be violent and he formed a heroin addiction before he turned 18. Just a few days after his 18th birthday, he enlisted in the US Army, but was discharged just a year later due to unsuitability. In 1972, he was arrested for fraud and was given an 18 month suspended prison sentence. He would of course violate his parole and was eventually sent to prison in California for 22 months. In October 1977, Shuest was arrested for the kidnap and rape of a 20 year old woman near Topanga Mall, to which he would eventually plead guilty to kidnap and assault with a deadly weapon, but the rape charge was dismissed. He was sentenced to four years in state prison, but would be paroled in less than that, free on parole by the middle of June 1980. He would be free for only three months before in September he was arrested for kidnap and robbery of two college students and the rape of one of them. On the back of this crime, he was sentenced to 12 years to life in prison with the possibility of parole. There's no denying this is a bad man, this is a criminal. And this whole timeline just so happens to place Shues as free in California from mid-June to mid-September 1980. As we know, the Ventura County and Kern County does would both be killed in mid-July. In 2008, his DNA struck a hit on the Kern County murder, but as I said, he wouldn't be arrested at this point for this. It wouldn't be until September 2013 that a detective called Steve Rhodes, along with Detective Joe Evans, travelled to Corcoran Prison to finally interview him. At this time, Chuest is 61 years old. This was because, just the year beforehand in 2012, DNA that had been collected from Ventura County Jane Doe's clothing and fingernails had finally been submitted into CODIS, and it had struck a match with Chuest, obviously. This finally connected her once and for all to the Kern County Doe, who, as we know, had already struck a match with him. But it would take a couple more years until September 2015 for Rhodes to return to the prison and arrest Wilson Shuest. The DNA evidence was undeniable. They knew they had their man for both the Kern County and Ventura County cases, no matter how much he denied it. And his trial began in May 2018 in Ventura County itself. This wasn't exactly a straightforward trial, especially when Dr. Peter Speth, who had autopsied Ventura County Jane Doe, pulled out as witness. He was meant to be one of the key witnesses. At this time, Speth was also due to be a key witness in the Golden State Killer case, having autopsied one of those victims, and he also had a bit of a spotty history. Speth had been convicted of witness tampering back in the 90s and had voluntarily surrendered his medical license on the back of this, although he did get it back nine years later and his conviction was expunged. I think Speth was just worried about drawing too much attention to himself and jeopardising the Golden State Killer case, which as we know was a huge case. The lawyers did actually file a motion to keep Speth's former tampering conviction out of the Shuest trial because it had been expunged as if it had never happened, but the judge ruled that it could be included and Speth was not happy about it, so he just didn't want to be a part of this big trial. Luckily though, the prosecution had videotaped his testimony from the prelim hearing a couple of years beforehand, so that was presented to the jury instead. 
They also presented evidence from Shues' three previous surviving victims who told their harrowing stories. Shues seemed to enjoy this. He was already in prison, he knew he was going back regardless. This was simply going to be more convictions to add to his already extensive roster. He just didn't care. And of course, he was found guilty of two counts of murder and the judge sentenced him to two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. He's going to die in prison. The day after his conviction, Rhodes visited Shuest in prison and he actually did let a small amount of information slip. That he'd picked up Kern County Jane Doe in a Leemore bar and Ventura County Jane Doe was a hitchhiker matching with what witnesses had said about seeing her hitchhiking. But we don't know if he's being truthful. Ventura County didn't seem to be a hitchhiker, she was very well dressed, she was manicured, her being a hitchhiker doesn't quite make sense. But we still don't know her identity, we don't know how correct that is or not, maybe she found herself in a bind and just needed to get a lift. But as of May 2021, we do know the identity of Kern County Jane Doe. She was Shirley Ann Suse, a member of the Cree Nation and Indigenous woman. In the July of 2018, Chief Dawn Ratliff of the Kern County Sheriff Coroner Division contacted none other than the DNA Doe Project for help in finally identifying Kern County Jane Doe. This was now one of those really rare cases where somebody had been convicted for the murder but the victim herself remained unidentified. They needed to know her name. However, this was 38 years on from the murder and the DNA found at the scene was now incredibly highly degraded and it would end up taking almost a year for them to obtain any DNA data that could be uploaded to GEDmatch. Genealogical work on this case didn't begin until May 2019, with Doe Project volunteers putting in 1,000 hours to this case. They knew from that point onwards that the Jane Doe was descended from Indigenous First Nations people from Canada, but this posed a problem. This is a population that is hugely underrepresented in DNA databases such as GEDmatch. As is stated on Shirley's page on the DNA Doe project, cases such as Shirley's are much more complicated because indigenous family histories are usually relayed orally, so there's very little written genealogical documentation available. But it would just so happen that in 2020, a woman called Violet Suse spoke at a women's conference about her search for her aunt, Shirley Suse, who had gone missing in 1979. Violet had made a promise to her grandmother that she would find Shirley and bring her home, a promise that she was still following through on even decades later. Just four days after speaking at this conference, Violet spotted a Facebook post from the DNA Doe Project, who said they were trying to identify an indigenous woman who had been murdered in Kern County, California. DNA Doe Project had purposely put out this post to indigenous communities in this area of Canada, having narrowed down that Jane Doe might have come from here. On the back of this, Violet submitted her DNA to the website listed in the post, GEDmatch, and just a few weeks later, a match was confirmed. Jane Doe was Shirley. It was a truly incredible identification. Violet had been out there actively searching for her aunt for nearly four decades, and the investigators in Shirley's case had also never given up. This just goes to show the power of social media when it's harnessed for good. It goes to show what I always say, how one person, that right one person sharing or seeing a post can lead to all the answers you need. Never underestimate the power that your shares can hold. Shirley Suse was a free spirit who loved to laugh and she cared deeply about her family, particularly for her mother. She was a residential school survivor and her heart was apparently broken when her two sons were taken from her and put into the child welfare system when their father reported she was an unfit mother. Her family say there was no truth in that, she was a wonderful, wonderful mother. From there, Shirley travelled, moving from the Samson Cree Nation south of Edmonton to British Columbia. The last time her family saw her in person was in 1977 when she came back home for a family funeral. At that time, she was working in Vancouver, sending money home to help with her mother's health care. The last time they heard from her was in 1979, when she said that she might go down to Seattle to visit a friend. And then they lost track. She stopped sending Christmas cards, birthday cards, Mother's Day cards. It was very clear that she was lost, that something had happened, because this just wasn't like Shirley. In her grief over losing her son, Shirley had turned to drugs and alcohol, but her family say that she never turned to the streets as far as they know, she never turned to sex work. Violet remembers one day suggesting that Shirley gets tattoos so they could identify her if the worst happened, her family were always worried about her, and Shirley would be found with a tattoo of her own name. 
On the 27th of May this year, 2022, Shirley's remains were finally brought back home to the Samson Cree Nation with a funeral being held the next day. Shirley will now stay at her family's resting place at Riverside Cemetery. Violet said to APTN News, It's no more not knowing, it's no more uncertainties. We are certain she is home now and we are certain that we can visit her gravesite, even though spiritually she is already with the Creator and our ancestors. We know that. Violet encourages other Indigenous people to train in DNA research so they can conduct their own forensic investigations and she has urged other families in similar situations not to give up, that if she can find Shirley after 40 years, anything is possible. And I really, really hope that's also going to be the case for our Ventura County Jane Doe. Her case is of course also with the DNA Doe Project where it is currently under the status of Research in Progress. Her page says, Samples of Ventura Jane Doe and her fetus have completed DNA extraction and sequencing. We are starting with the mother. At this point, they've been working this case for over two years, but they're really struggling. Once again, there's a lack of close matches to her DNA and Jed match, and it seems that her family might have come from Mexico, which arises a whole load of complications. They have successfully found some common ancestors of the Ventura County Jane Doe and her DNA cousins, but we're talking distant, distant cousins here. The way this process works is by essentially building out a family tree from scratch. You've got to identify relations in common and just continually narrow that down until you find a close family tree, until you find Jane Doe's potential immediate family who can DNA test and get confirmation. Although they have found some connections, they found possible surnames and geographic locations of interest, these are very vague as the DNA cousins are so distant. DNA Doe Project are urging people to share their DNA on GEDmatch, specifically people from the areas which I'm about to share. So they have five main regions of interest here, and please bear with me because I'm pretty sure I'm about to butcher the names of some Mexican states. I'm going to put the names on screen here so you can actually see rather than try and understand my pronunciations. So these areas of interest are southern Texas and northeastern Mexico, specifically the states of Coahuila, Tamaulipas and Nuevo León. We have Central Mexico, so Zacatecas, Guanajuato, and San Luis Potosi. I'm so sorry for my pronunciations. <laughs> then Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado, Indigenous California, and Guatemala. Jane Doe may have also had a more distant connection to England, Ireland, and or French Canada. One area though in which they have made significant progress is in her ancestral connection to the Mexican state of Zacatecas. Zacatecas, I'm so sorry. They strongly believe that one line of her ancestry originates from a small community called La Blanca, Bajo de la Tesserera, in a city now named General Pamphilo Natera. Two of Jane Doe's direct ancestors are a couple named Panciano Montalano, born around 1823, and Feliciano Rojas, born around 1824. This couple had six daughters, so Paula, Martina, Maria, Refugio, Catalina, Albina, and Antonia, and one son called Gabriel. Several of their descendants might have migrated to the United States, particularly to El Paso, Texas, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Southern California. Some common surnames amongst other descendants of the Montalano family who migrated to the US are Alaman, Alvarez, Alvarado, Arismendi, Betancourt, Campos, Cuervas, Hernandez, Lara, Lira, Ortiz, Parga, Payan, Ramirez, Salazar, Sestayata, and Villarreal. If you share any of these surnames, obviously some of them are much more common than others, and live in any of the areas I've mentioned, I urge you to consider sharing your DNA information on GEDmatch. In November 2021, it was announced they'd actually been able to identify the fetus's father via his DNA. The father's name was not announced, but he was identified as a Honduran immigrant who was associated with a community of Central American immigrants in the Koreatown district of Los Angeles. Investigators have been in contact with the father, but they haven't been able to discover any fresh information about Jane Doe. Reading between the lines here, it seems like it might have been nothing more than a one night stand, and this was 42 years ago now. The man likely doesn't remember her name or anything specific about her. I can imagine this was disappointing for the investigators. A lot of time and energy had gone into identifying the father in the hope that he might be able to provide more answers. Obviously, he was never going to be a suspect, as Shu West was the one responsible for the murder, but he might have been able to tell them something. Investigators are now urging people to look at and share the facial reconstruction of Ventura County Jane Doe, and let them know if anyone thinks they might have known her or her family members in the 1980s or 1970s. 
I have so much faith that Jane Doe is going to be reunited with her identity. I think it's a matter of when, not if in this case. But I do think it will probably be in a very similar way as how Shirley Suse was identified through somebody recognising a photo or details and sharing what they know. This is a vital time to share this information, so please do. I'll leave a link in the description box to a Facebook post by the DNA Doe Project about this case, so it'll be very easy for you to go over and just share it, especially if you live in any of the areas I mentioned, or potentially share a surname. I really hope in the next year or so I'll be coming back at you with a big update in this case, hopefully her identification, hopefully we'll have some answers about who she was, and this case can finally be put to rest. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.